here in a minute. Doesn't that sound awesome? I'm gonna show you exactly what we did to get there because it's all about the ride. Welcome to Studio Hot Rods. Restoration Revelations, man. We're gonna go for a good ride as we're working on four Chevelle, actually five. That red one just showed up. A buddy of mine wanted me to build a whole car for him. And I'm like, I can't do it. So I'm trying to fix a couple things for him and ship it back. So he can enjoy driving that car as I go out and find him another one to build. Anyways, we got to get rolling. So we're gonna hop over and look at that ghost gray one where we're at. We're smoothing out the firewall. Come on. Okay, so here we go digging into the ghost gray trans tunnel. Now, this is kind of a trick. We had to see if the tunnel we actually made was gonna actually work with our engine and transmission placement. We got comfortable with that, knowing that that was gonna go real well. Now that we got the trans tunnel in place, we can kind of smooth out the firewall. And now we're gonna hop over to the number three car, actually four car, whatever. The Black Pearl has been blasted and has its first coat of epoxy. Let's go take a look at it. This still smells a little fresh in here, don't get me wrong. This is the chassis of the Black Pearl that we just took apart. It's been through the media blast, so it's all the media blasted, it's been prepped, and now we got it in the epoxy primer. The epoxy primer seals everything up. So if I want like the insides of these channels, see over there, boom, 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 I want it all sealed up. Have you got raw steel? And then this is the core support that we'll be working on as well. So this has been media blasted as well. Everything under the engine bay, under the hood, under the car, everything is freshened up when we build these restoration revelations. Rather than buying an aftermarket perimeter chassis, we make these OEM chassis. And they're light. Aftermarket chassis typically are three to 500 pounds heavier than the stock ones. Did you know that? There's your tech tip. Anyways, we're gonna get this all up and rolling. Come on, follow me out. I'm gonna walk you over to the Ghost Gray car's chassis that actually, we're in the process of putting the engine, the LT4, and the transmission in it because he wants to sink it in the weeds. We had to get that height just right, and we just found the perfect headers to put on. Instead of making them, they're out there. You just gotta find them, come on. This is the OEM header that comes on that supercharged LT4. And everybody thinks they know better than GM. You don't. Now, we can make them go faster. Emissions, da 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 we can talk about that. But these shorty little, this is called a Tri-Y design. I think it was actually designed by Carol Sheldon. I could be wrong. But anyways, look at, see the Y here? There's a Y between these two, and then there's a Y here. It's called the Tri-Y, design still used by General Motors today on a brand new, what would probably be in a Corvette or a ZL1. Kind of cool, but anyways, now this is a little too small of a port. I don't want to put that much back pressure on it, but having some back pressure on a supercharged motor is actually a really good idea because what it does is it gives you better drivability. You're gonna get a little bit more torque and you're gonna get a lot more pedal feel in it. If you put a ton of boost on it and you have a different cam and some of those things, you'll get the horsepower, but the drivability kind of, it's a trade-off. You don't get everything. You just don't get it all. So we found these little shorty style headers. We originally were looking at going with a log tube, but I was like, I don't want a long tube header. This is good. If we're gonna go with the Brian Tooley cam and we're gonna push some more boost at it, and really let it open up for the cam that needs to flow at high RPMs. This thing's gonna breathe. This is gonna breathe a lot. Look at that. Look at the difference. Little baby one, right? Hefty, hefty, right? But a nice intermediary is this. Got a nice heavy flange on it. But if you notice, it's a very compact design and it's kind of like an intermediary between a little choke down one that was on the OEM, right, from General Motors and the big free flowing one. So this one, just like the three little bears, this bed's too soft, this one's too hard, this one's just right. This one is just right. Now we can put the engine and transmission in the location because we've got the perfect marriage.
Now that we got the fitment and location of our LT4 motor coupled again with that 6L80E, right? Into the A body chassis over there, we have to go ahead and finish weld all of the detailed structure. So each one of those welds takes a little bit of time. It's not a real fast process. Jeff, you're taking that, right? Some of it. The delicate stuff you want to take. Uh, heavier stuff you could use a bag, but right now I hear a TIG. It's always got that real high frequency line in it. That's why I said, is that a TIG? And it's, come on, let's take a look. It's really cool. Because I got two chassis now that we're getting ready to work on basically at the same time. This is how the chassis totally looks. After we've taken it out of the, this came out of the black pearl, and we went in there, the media box, we cleaned it all up, it goes right there into our prime station. And then it comes out looking like this. It looks like a new, almost looks new, doesn't it? It's clean, it's simple. Everything gets coated with the epoxy primer because once you start cutting into it, I don't want anything getting exposed for long periods of time with raw steel. Bad idea. It's not an environmentally controlled facility. We don't want a lot of moisture getting into it, that kind of stuff. We want to seal it up as soon as we can. So as soon as we're done welding, so it goes through two stages of welding. The first stage of the welding is set all the parameters of all the things in place, right, after it's been epoxy primed once, then all the structure gets laid into it after we got the engine trans exactly where we wanted it. Now all the structure is getting finished welded. So when you first put it in there, we kind of tack it all in place until we say, yep, that's the home, that's the spot, that's where it's staying. Yeah, you just finished up doing it, the cross brace for the trans, right? Yeah, yeah. Beautiful, look at the weld right there. Look at the kind of welding you guys. Don't get too close, it's hot, Kyle. Wait, you can see this one here. Great, huh? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very nice, Jeff. Very nice. Thank you. Very nice. Very nice. This beautiful one right here. This beautiful one right here. We, this is where they start. Nice and clean and pretty. And this is where they end up. Actually, they end up back in the paint booth one more time. So now that we got the engine and trans populated in there, we'll take that back off. And this will go in for the epoxy primer and the final paint. Kind of cool, huh? Side by side. I like it. I like it. I wanted to give you guys a good vision of like, how. look at how this thing moves. Here's really cool. A cool little test. If I just lift up on here, watch it flex. Look at you. Can you see the flex in it? Look at how much that moves. It's just totally flexing. I can't do it on this one because it's sitting on different stuff. But if you were to do that same test here, you wouldn't see the same type of movement at all, especially in the center section of this. Remember, the body of the car and the frame have a cooperative relationship. It's not just the frame that stiffens your car, it's the not just the body, but in this A-style body, with, especially the coupe, the body and the chassis work together in tandem to give you the stiffness that you're looking for versus the unibody. This thing now, being all tied together, it's not relying on the body almost nearly like it once was, because it's got it, man. This is a nice hoop, heavy duty, trans support, all links it together, and it's nicely nested in there. That's a side-by-side -side comparison. Both 1970 Chevelle A-frames. One's got our signature, one is about to. The fact that we build A-body, 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 we have multiple cars in process at the same time, it makes it wonderful, just wonderful, to be able to grab another car and set da 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 that motor and trans, talking about the final fitment and placement of that thing, super important because we got to sink it in the weeds. The customer's name is Chad, and he wants his car to ride. Sunk down in the weeds a little bit. We're doing a final, final check right now on the clearances of my car. So you only have to split the difference between the height of the motor with the hood and the height of the transmission and where it lands into the frame. So we're just doing a check it again, check it again, check it again. You know, measure twice, cut once. Okay. Don't cut twice, measure again, you know, because he's already screwed it off. So we're making sure we don't have a problem with the earth and parts. You got a transmission hanging down considerably. I knew that because it's taller. We couldn't bump that thing like the back of it up. Does that help? Yes. Pinion angle and engine angle are critical to the way the car feels, the way the car handles, the way it transfers the power from the engine to the wheels. Lots of guys have big racks on these angles and these things, and they get these pinion angles that have to match it, and you end up with a Ugh. I got this one set at three degrees. That's about the optimal the OEM, pretty much Shell Gemma motors at Ford. They pretty much set them two and a half, three degrees is like the standard rule of thumb. So I am not smarter than the engineers at GM. 
I will take their advice, I will follow their path, and I will lean on the shoulders of giants. That's right, we'll stand right on it. Can you guess what this is? This is a tool that we made. So basically when you're welding stainless, you don't want a lot of sugar inside of it. If you put the gas from the TIG welder into the pipe itself through a little fitting like that, but then you fill it with the gas, you don't get no sugar on the inside. Sugar on the inside is like uh, oxidization. You don't want it to be anything but smooth on the inside of it. So you gotta back feed it with gas. And this little tool is something that'll go on that exhaust. Now that we're wrapping up where the engine and transmission are, we can put that exhaust exactly where it's supposed to be. Back gassing, baby, back gassing. Here the back gassing, Jackie's cooking lunch. <laughs> Could be interesting. Let's go over there and see what she's making. Are you bugging Jackie Murph? She yeah, is trying to she, critique my... No, she started without me letting her film her. She got a fire going. Uh -huh. Leave her alone. It's just a fire. Leave her I'm alone. Start the pro I'm supposed to capture this. Uh-huh, well. Well, I don't know, like, aren't you supposed to like, cut this first? Oh, here's our first mistake. I don't think I remember how to do this. Well, you're doing it right. Oh. If it comes to alcohol, I don't know what I'm doing. You're making me nervous. I know, I am nervous because you're filming me and I do this. That's how I always have done my cutting. You hungry? Yeah. Mm. I like when you get snuffed. I like my you got Yeah, me too. It's time for wine. Ah. It's in my Lemonade. Don't steal it. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, it's just a dump and go, man. Dump and go. Chess. Whoa. We're going all in on the chess. Cucumber ranch. I call this the iron kitchen. Who's got cool chairs in a place like this in the hot rod shop to actually share food together? Let's go now and start working through the exhaust on that 1969 Chevelle. That's the prototype. I got some figuring to do. I got some wiring to do. I'll show you how I set it up, but I'm gonna change that. This is our number one car, and this is our prototype. And right now, this week, we're gonna be modifying a couple things as I've been driving, tuning it, and the engine tuning it, suspension tuning it, now I'm gonna tune the exhaust. That's kind of cool, right? So we're gonna put uh, a device in there. It's actually like a bypass. Not an exhaust up by coming out on the ground and it's gonna rattle your ears off. This actually turns and goes still through the exhaust, but it makes it just straight pipes. I'll show you, but let's do a sound check real quick to see what she sounds like before and after. Modified straight through exhaust. That's coming up next. Merck. Let me explain to you why I didn't get videotape of us actually putting the exhaust and those new bypass mufflers in. Because we did it on Sunday and you weren't working. <laughs> and me and Jeff went over to the shop when nobody was around. And I just wanted to get these things installed to see if I liked the sound. I was nervous, like. Is it really gonna sound the way I want it to sound? I've seen a lot of guys use these, these uh, Veltronic mufflers on like little import, you know, little fart cans and stuff. 
I don't want to sound like no fart can, right? So I wanted to get them installed to say, hey, is that something I even want to do? Now, currently, it only works with a remote switch, and there's a little compressor, vacuum generator. It's shoved in the trunk, all temporarily kind of put in place because I just wanted to hear the sound of it. Run it around, see how it drives, see what it sounds like. That is done. But let me show you what the exhaust actually kind of looks like in there. And then I'm going to walk you through exactly how I plan on wiring this thing up. you got to remember, Porsche has exhaust like this, Ferrari has exhaust, Chevrolet has exhaust like this and their Corvettes and their Camaros with that bypass going on. But I can't find anybody that sells a unit that actually will work because I thought it was going to be like when you had no vacuum, it would go over the bypass. That's the whole goal is your engine, you floor the gas, you lose vacuum, and then that was because I thought the exhaust would be coming right there. Ah, uh -uh. the way this is set up is you need vacuum put on it to actually bypass it, so it's actually backwards. So I have to make a circuit, and I'll show you that in a minute. But exactly how I'm going to design it if I like it, and I really, really like it. Let me show you what it looks like. So I drew this up this morning. Basically, what we have here, I'll walk you through it. Here's your engine, your vacuum source. I'm going to put a low vacuum sensor trigger and a high vacuum sensor trigger. I'm going to use a reservoir here that'll be in the same circuit as my brake booster, right? So that runs to about 20 inches of mercury. So I'll have a reservoir of vacuum there and a reservoir of vacuum there. You never want to tap into that reservoir because you don't want to affect your brakes. Now, the next thing is I got to, when I have a low vacuum, that means you're on the throttle and your gas is open, right? And your volume, uh, your vacuum drops. I'm going to have a trigger. So a low vacuum sensor trigger that will trigger the low vacuum sensor solenoid right there. So what it'll do is it'll open up my vacuum reservoir and it will pull on those two valves, open up the exhaust like we talked about, right? Now, when the, when you let off the gas, the vacuum is gonna come back up, it's gonna increase. That's the way they work. This is a high vacuum trigger. That will actually open up this vacuum solenoid right here, high pressure vacuum, open the open air. It will relieve the vacuum that's in it and allow those to close. Anyways, it's gonna have three, it's gonna have a sport mode, Trailer park mode, because I've lived in the trailer park before and I know what that's like and I liked it. And then I'm gonna have what I call stealthy mode. So when you're in sport mode, it does exactly what it's supposed to do. So you're on the gas, wah, 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 and it's all fun and dancing, right? When you're in trailer park mode, I'm just gonna use the high, uh, the low trigger sensor to open it up all the time. So it's just gonna be open so you can just run around and play with it, open all the time and it sounds really good. Also, these mufflers don't drone at all inside of the car, which is really a big deal. I can't stand droning, right? So that's a really cool thing. And then the stealthy mode, I'll just never allow them to open. So really it bypasses both of those sensors so it can't ever trigger either one of those solenoids to open. Simple, complicated, but cool. Really cool. I love the fact I'm an engineer. I'm hoping that somebody's got something like it. If they don't, maybe I'll sell it. Maybe I'll just, I'll sell them cars for sure. But anyways, let's get this bad boy down and give it one last sound. I want you to hear it. bigger and better than just cool cars. Come on, hang with me for a second. Let me share you with something I came across this week that I think is absolutely amazing. Things are not always as they appear. So here's the deal. You know what I love about the Bible? I keep sharing this with people as we go through the episodes because, man, if you got the Bible in your life, it's like the only book that like talks about how the world was made all the way until actually how it ends. I really encourage you to get one. But there's something that's really cool to me. It's because I think about like the realms, the dimension. You know, if there's good, there's evil. We all have seen the evil in the world, right? Guys, you ever see the good? It's like crazy. Like heavenly realms. And what's heavenly realm? There's an earth, there's heaven. Talking about Jesus wasn't even here before the world was, was made. But this is kind of cool. Let me just read this to you real quick. It's in uh, Ephesians 6, 10, I think. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Uh, put on the full armor of God so that you can stand against the devil's schemes. Who schemes? The devil schemes. So that's pretty cool. He talks about there's good, there's God, and there's this bad dude, the devil, right? You can stand against the schemes. For our struggles are not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against authorities, against powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Like, the world is so much bigger. Like, this place, like, there's so much more 
then you can see. You couldn't see the cool exhaust in the car until I actually turned it on. How'd you do that, right? It was kind of cool. Man, if you dig into the Word a little bit, you can read the Bible, and there's so much stuff. I would just really encourage you to grab yourself a good, like, an NIV Bible. Spend all the time. Ask God. Just you, you can read a little piece and say, what does that mean? What is the spiritual realm? What, you know, who's this devil do? You know, how does that work? Find a good Bible. And reach out to other people that you respect, that you think actually are grounded in faith. Ask them what this is about. Seriously, get together a little bit of community. I'm not talking about church. Church is in here. All right, peace out. Thanks for joining. Like, subscribe, follow along. It's been fun. See ya.